Julia, where do I even start? First of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And second of all, how surreal is this for you right now and why? It's like I've landed on another planet, if I'm honest. (laughs) Um, I never imagined my life going this way, but I'm really excited by it. Mm, I can't wait to dive in. But before we do, I want to do 10 quick fire questions. Fab. To break the ice and all of that. So, number one, three in one, name, oh, I put age on there, name, age, profession. Um, name, Julia. Age, I'm 48. Uh, profession, oh, I'm kind of in between. I'm a sports massage therapist and I'm now a eating disorder recovery coach. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> number two, sweet or savoury? Can I say neither, just crunchy? Yeah, you're a crunchy, aren't you? It's so yeah, true. I don't mind if it's sweet or savoury, but it, I, I like it to be crunchy. Texture. Number three, early bird or night owl? 100% early. Knew that. Oh, mm, I'm trying to guess your answers before I even ask you. Number four, weights or cardio, if you had to pick one? Weights. Okay. Number five, three things you love. Um, watching the sunrise when I walk my dogs in the morning. Mm. Spending time with my family. And nowadays, me. Oh, I wish I had recorded our ever first conversation. <laughs> You're a different person. For a start, I remember you had your uh, video, so you could only just see like the, your head because you were so hiding. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're just be like, like this <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was okay number six do you have a favorite quote or a mantra that you like to remind yourself of um I guess that fear turns into courage when you turn and face it mm, fear turns into courage when you turn and face it amen Number seven, something that you like that others may consider strange or weird. <laughs> it's a bit gross. Um, I actually really like pulling the hairs out of the bath plug hole. Oh, really? <laughs> Especially when it comes out as like a big like <laughs> load of hair. Isn't that disgusting? Or cleaning the tumble dryer filter. I like that as well. That is my most favourite thing to do, to get the fluff and be like, oh, yeah. it's so satisfying. Yeah, the hair thing's like that, really. Yeah, it's satisfying, but I'm still grossed out by it, even if it's my own hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer I've ever had on here, to be honest. <laughs> I like to be different. Exactly. Okay, oh, I'm excited to hear this one. Number eight, three things that you love specifically about yourself. Oh, um, mm, I love that I can laugh and I find a lot of things funny um, <laughs> in quite a childish way, if I'm honest. I love that I can help people feel peaceful. Mm. And I love that... I can bake really well. I can vouch for that. As you know. <laughs> I've literally just come off a of FaceTime with my mum, which you're going to meet as but because as you've already gathered from the messages she's sending you, when I come to see you and visit you, she's obviously wanting to be involved. Um, and I was <laughs> saying, oh my God, Julia does the better brownies than my sister, Michelle. And my mum was like, oh, really? I was like, definitely. And that's a statement to make. <laughs> so yes. Oh no, and now you've actually put that on air. Yes. Your sister's going to be cross. She doesn't even listen to my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and if she did, she'd totally be fine with it. She doesn't mind. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> but you're, yeah, you bake incredibly. Thank you. Okay, number nine. Imagine this. Fast forward to the distant future when you're 100 years old and you're on your deathbed and you're looking back at the life you've lived, so it might be the life you've already lived or the future that you've not lived yet, but you're looking back 
over your entire life, what are you most proud of? That I was able to experience pain and difficulty and turn it into something positive. Mm. Yeah. And last question, Julia, from the fire questions, because we're just going to get into it. What do you want people to take away from this conversation today? Hope. Mm. If I can recover after being like 40 years in an eating disorder, anyone can. They just need to want to do it and show up for themselves. Yes. So let's dive straight into that because, and this is why I'm so freaking excited that you've decided or you've been led to, it's not really something you've decided. You've decided to take the action on the the intuitive feeling that you're going to be and you are a recovery coach because the amount of women I get messaging me and we're at different stages. I mean, I'm almost 36. Obviously, we all have our own story. I get so many women messaging me in anorexia who are similar age to you. So like, like late 40s who are like, how is it even possible to recover after having anorexia for like, what, 20, 30, 40 years? So can you start with your story, go as in-depth or as as shallow as you like but when did it start for you up until when you reached out to me okay um I guess I started feeling unhappy with how my body was when I was about four um there was a little girl who was also called Julia who lived in my road and we used to play together And they used to call her little Julia and me big Julia. Mm. And when I look at photos, I wasn't big. I wasn't overweight in any way, shape or form. I just, I had a lovely little body of a lovely little girl. But my child brain took that as you're too big. You're big, Julia. So um, it kind of started there. And I don't know, I didn't interpret my childhood in the most positive way that I could have done. I think I was probably quite sensitive and I just grew up not feeling good enough, not feeling like I could be good enough or worthy. And I just kind of became quite a perfectionist, trying trying so hard all the time to get everything right and to do everything trying too hard and lost completely lost who I was because I was just trying to be what everybody else wanted to try and measure up I guess Mm. um and when I was probably about 12 I became um vegan in quotes (laughs) yeah just really as an excuse of how to say no to food so that I could lose weight. Um, It wasn't trendy at all then to be vegan and there was no like Mm. alternatives or anything. So I used to be able to say no to all the meals at home because I was vegan and couldn't eat them and basically have a cup of soup every day. And that was kind of about it. And I used to wear loads and loads and loads of layers so that my parents didn't notice. Um, And then the school called my parents in, which wasn't, the happiest moment of my teenage years Mm. um and it all kind of got swept under the carpet and I conformed to what they wanted on the outside but I always still had this not good enough not worthy not wanting to be seen thoughts in my mind um kind of stumbled through teenage years with lurching from one disaster to another really um all of which still made me feel less than um I guess things kind of went quite well when I met my husband Mm -hmm. and I did have a period when I did feel okay and I ate quite well um but that kind of developed then into I had my first child and he had a severe anaphylactic allergy to egg, which is in just about everything. And so 
I became really, really obsessive about what everyone ate and what was in everything and started to, well, it kind of just went straight into orthorexia really and everything had to be perfect and everything had to be clean and that then for me morphed into um, more restricting um, excessive exercise like so much and um, then I discovered intermittent fasting which was just the most fabulous excuse not to eat in the world yeah because it was trendy at one point <laughs> it still is trendy right? yeah yeah um, so I would have one meal a day um, for years actually years and years I had one meal a day and then probably every two weeks I'd fast completely for about four or five days <laughs> no um, hell hell on earth <laughs> and I just carried this on um getting up in the morning walking the dogs going for a run going to CrossFit walking the dogs again going for another walk later um not eating doing loads of training and then a couple of years ago my dad died and it brought up a lot of buried emotion that I had never ever processed because one of the parts of my childhood was it was kind of not permitted in our family to show any emotion or express emotion or talk about money or or anything really it was it was very sort of stiff upper lip, keep calm and carry on type thing. Um, and all the emotions that I'd buried just kind of started spiraling out and I'd never learned how to process them. And I didn't know what to do. And I thought I was going mad. Mm -hmm. And my solution was to pretty much stop eating completely because that's how I'd always handled everything. I'd just numbed it by restricting. Mm -hmm. And... I literally did completely stop eating. And after about two weeks of nothing at all, I would have like a yoga every couple of days. Became really good in deceiving my family about that I had eaten here and I'd eaten there, but I hadn't. Um, and I just got thinner and thinner and sicker and sicker. And then I got banned from my CrossFit gym. My coach was like, you're not safe to train anymore. Um, which again, made me feel like my world had ended because that was one of the things I relied on. So I was just running and walking like a minimum of 30,000 steps every day. Mm. Um, walking plus runs. And I just got to a point where I didn't know what to do and I couldn't see any end and I couldn't see any future. And I kind of planned an exit. Um, wasn't the best plan in the world, but my, I suppose, my powerful love for my children made me kind of think, well, maybe I can just try something one last try. And I went to the doctors, um, and she put me on the waiting list for the eating disorder service. Um, but the waiting lists in the UK are absolutely huge and you've literally got to be within hours of death to be seen any sooner um she put me in touch with the emergency team who phoned me up and were like are you going to kill yourself today and I was like no not today and they were like oh okay then we'll discharge you wow so it wasn't particularly helpful for me. I understand that services are really, really stretched mm. and they do do their best. They really yeah. do. I can't, can't say they don't because they do, but they just don't have the capacity. Mm. Um, so I started listening to podcasts and um, I heard you. Wow. I mean, what a story. <laughs> and where do I want to go? Just to reflect back and to clarify with the listeners, so you would say at this point, until we met each other, you was in the anorexia for, what, 40 years? Pretty much, yeah. With a tiny bit in between where I'm sh I'm sure the God, God, the universe allowed you to have children. So yeah. you had to eat something to be able to conceive, right? And then the love for your children stopped you from taking your own life. 
yeah bigger picture I see and I know I'm you know spiritual but I see if you hadn't have had children then who knows right so I'm just feeling yeah. grateful out loud that you had children which is why you're here today what I mean I know you you started working with someone just before you met me so you can share her name or not share her name whatever you like but what what initially made you think these are my choices and my life or get better did did was there any part of your decision or choice that was allowing you to stay in the same hellhole that you was in and why not and what to just stay in anorexia and not do either I don't think I would have survived anyway no I I had reached absolute rock bottom Mm. I was barely functioning at all I couldn't think and your husband obviously can I say his name yeah and the lovely Dave, I'm sure he was try like what, so people can really understand your family and how it affected them. How okay. did it affect them? Um, the real rock bottom where I literally wasn't eating and I was getting really, really sick was um, in the middle of blueberry season. And my husband is a blueberry farmer. So he was literally out for sort of like 14 to 18 hours a day. And we don't really see each other at that time of year for a couple of months because he just comes home to sleep. Mm. So he actually didn't notice. Mm. He didn't know what was going on, which was why it was so easy for me to hide. Um, Two of my sons don't live at home, so they didn't really see me. And the other one was working full time and out with his friends and stuff. So he didn't see me. So they didn't really know a lot of what was going on until I got to the point where I couldn't put that that mask on at the end of the day when they came home. I didn't have the strength left to do it. Mm. And I couldn't pretend everything was okay. Um... And then they were, initially Dave was really, really upset with me for hiding it all from him and didn't understand why I haven't told him. Um, But I don't think, I I just didn't know how. Yeah. Um, I do have some incredible friends who found me a therapist and dragged me off to this therapist who was really helpful. Um, In a way, she wasn't, I don't know how to describe it, really. She was, um, she did get me having, she said I had to have a bite of food um, at least four times a day. But she also did say that I had to be careful how much I ate because I could start going the other way, which wow. wasn't helpful. Um, and then I read a book um, by a recovery coach and I contacted her because my husband took me away. He took me on a holiday as a sort of like, well, let's get you away from home. And that that will just ma- magically make everything better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a fixer. He likes to yeah. fix things. And to be fair, it did kind of give my head a bit of a break not being at home. Um, and I managed to get this recovery coach. And she was really, really good in making me accountable for eating and making me start eating um and yeah she was really really good at that and I did start eating but everything that was making me want to restrict was all still there Mm. and that's where she wasn't helping me um and yeah so that's when you came along so it was more that the how long was you working with her until we met each other um about six weeks about six weeks so for six weeks so you got to the point where you were like do or die and you chose do yes. and something had to happen because of where you were at you found this this book this person and she was good at helping you with the behavior part so the actual yes. physical chewing swallowing eating yeah 
But like you said, the actual root cause of all of it wasn't being looked at at that point anyway. No. And so it was just constant forcing over the problem. Yeah. And I had no no hunger signals at all. Mm. So I was just terrified to eat. Yeah. So it was just all, yeah, literally forcing everything the whole time. Yeah. And then we met. And I'm so grateful <laughs> that we did. And it's so, so interesting. Much how we met you heard me on a podcast we had the consultation call at the time you reflected back to me and it's true I've tweet I've tweeted it a little bit my website was primarily aimed at binge eating really yes with the language but something brought you here and then you helped me because I changed my website language a bit because I can absolutely help women with anorexia I've been through it myself as well and we started working together and what I was just in awe of from the get-go working with you, Julia, is yes, of course, the fear was there. You were crying over bowls of porridge and all, all of the that time <laughs> that I could support you through. And this is really what I want to speak to it today at this moment. You were actually doing the action. So, and we're going to go into this, like the journey together wasn't just about eating. It was about a lot more than that. But when yes, someone is in the position you were in, Mm-hmm. And of course, logically, you just eat, but obviously it's not as easy as we'll just eat then. How did you over and over again eat when your whole entire body mind was screaming at you not to? Um, partly because I'm really bloody minded. <laughs> <laughs> and when I decide to do something, I'm really, really determined. That was probably why I was so good at restricting. Yes. Because I'm so determined and it was, yeah, it was easy to block out eating and not do it. Mm. Um, but yeah, when I just felt I had nothing to lose at all and everything to gain. And my alternative was to it was to do or die really. And um, so I just knew that I had to show up for myself 100% again and again and again, because there was no other option as far as I was concerned. Mm. I was completely all in whatever it takes. Yeah. And can you describe, I know there's a lot that went on, but let's just start with the first four to six weeks or so of working together like how would you if you can remember looking back in hindsight how would you describe like that part of it so we're going to go in like three different sections of our work together what was like the first part like where I was like oh by the way you need to message me every day all of this and you were like oh is it okay to and I'm like send me photos of everything you're eating like what did you feel about that support was it overwhelming or conflicting no it was like being wrapped in a big blanket of love and care and support and just having somebody who believed in me and it enabled me to put all my focus on recovering because I'd given up everything else I'd stopped working I stopped training at the gym. I stopped walking. I'd stopped doing everything Mm. just to focus on recovering. Yes. And so it gave me a focus. It gave me something to do was to take photos of every single meal I ate, every bite I ate and every amount I'd left. Mm -hmm. And every time I wavered, you made my head spin and (laughs) (laughs) made me answer loads of questions. (laughs) Um, but it was it was just incredible having somebody there all the time Mm. yeah which is why you've chose to become a coach which of course we're going to go into and that's why I did because therapists do a great job but from having therapy all my most of my adult life as well it's there's something there's that massive support missing isn't there yeah it was like having my own cheerleader Mm. and even Some of the messages were just like you said, were just like waiting. <laughs> put it on fork, put it in mouth, chew. <laughs> <laughs> With the gifts and the emojis we can use yeah. to like bring the humor into it when it feels right. It's it's so necessary, isn't it? That extra yes. Yeah. Um, so much so. And how did you start to navigate when we got into the actual root cause of all of this, the feelings, the trauma? 
and the things that I won't say that you've experienced as a child what was that like because so many of us <laughs> afraid to even go there and I was so afraid um it was like destroying and freeing at the same time mm. it was um I guess we'd built up a lot of trust mm. um and I felt safe talking to you mm. <laughs> it, it because I'd never cried and I'd never expressed emotion. There was so much to come up. Um, so yeah, it, it was incredibly painful, but I felt safe and I felt supported. Mm. And once it had come up and I'd cried and I'd let, let the pain out, it just created each time, just created a little bit more space inside me where I could function a bit more mm. and replace that self-hatred with a little bit of self-love each time mm. and then <laughs> I have to bring this up because you know what I'm going to say it made me laugh in the most beautiful way ever after all the depth of the sadness and the pain and that was a lot there then came anger <laughs> 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 and I asked uh, yeah. all of the listeners I asked Julia to because ju you didn't feel safe expressing anger no and no. I wanted Julia to express anger in a safe way and she wrote <laughs> <laughs> she swore more than me and that is saying something I did yeah <laughs> wow I mean to read that I mean, journaling was a big help for you, wasn't it? Do you want to describe how you found journaling and why it was helpful for you? Do you know, it's funny. I never thought I would be someone that journaled at all. Um, but it was just like when I started to write stuff down, then I could see it from different angles. Mm. And I could kind of break it down and think, well, why am I thinking that? What's leading me to think that? And just kind of made things a lot clearer mm. and it could also just get rid of not get rid of allow some emotions out that I didn't know how to express in any other way yeah I feel the same with journaling I used to roll my eyes I used to be like oh <laughs> here we go with the journaling thing again but then when you really do pick up an actual physical pen onto paper and write you learn so much about yourself. Yeah, I think I was stuck in the dear diary today. I got up at 7 a.m. and then I, <laughs> and that's yeah. what I thought journaling was. I had no idea that it was actually a way of getting to know yourself and expressing and writing angry fucking letters to people. <laughs> <laughs> Me swear, no fucking way. <laughs> And then, I mean, obviously these aren't linear stages, but then I'm kind of going through your journey and in, in what I saw along the way, then started to come the the true joy and the true moments where you would message me and be like, oh my God, I feel something that feels so good. And can you describe how that felt when you fully opened your heart to let life in? Yeah, Um I didn't, I knew that I buried and numbed all my negative emotions, but I never realized that that meant I never felt the good emotions either. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like my heart had opened and it just felt like 10 times bigger. And I could, even just hearing the birds sing in the mornings when I was walking the dogs was just like, made me want to dance with joy. Mm -hmm. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I'd never had that level of happy or laughed as much. It's bloody beautiful. And of course you were actually nourishing yourself at this point as well. So your yes. body started to get enough nourishments to actually function. Yes, 24 hours a day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you want to talk about eating specifically? So your night, 
your Belvita <laughs> saviors that <laughs> talk yeah. about that. And also some physical things that, you know, that you've gone through and perhaps are still experiencing as your body has been starving since you were like a child compared mm-hmm. to now actually nourishing and taking care of yourself. What did you experience as that was going going on? Um, I suppose that's probably one of the most challenging parts to cope with. I gained weight really fast, mm. um, too far bigger than I've ever been in my life, uh, probably even when I was pregnant. And I've read all the science, I've done all the research, and I know all the answers of why you have an overshoot weight and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't really make it feel any easier. Mm-hmm. And I suffer, still suffer with a lot of edema. Um, and I guess I just learned to listen to what my body is telling me. Like when the edema gets really bad, my body is basically telling me to stop moving around and stay still and start resting. Mm. I love how you say that with annoyance still in your voice. I can expect <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I still feel it's like a bit of revenge for all the starvation, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, but I suppose it is really hard to cope with the weight gain. Mm. Um, and part of me has always thought, well, it's only temporary, it's only temporary, it's only temporary. But then I realised that thinking like that is not accepting Mm -hmm. how it is. Yes. Um, I say I realised I did get kind of nudged that way. (laughs) Oh, I wonder who by. (laughs) Body love coach over here. (laughs) Um, So just kind of learning to appreciate what my body has done for me and still does for me and realising that even though I might not like how my body looks and... I might struggle with how my body feels because it it feels very different to be in than my old body. Mm. Um, This is the body that's keeping me alive. And this is the body that I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life in. Yeah. And I wouldn't go back to that very cold and miserable place where the only future I could see was by ending my life. I remember you showed me a photo. Was that the holiday that Dave took you on because he, bless him, he thought a change of environment would just fix everything? And Julia showed me this photo and I was like, how do I say something in the nicest way possible that isn't just purely rude? (laughs) What did I come up with in the end? You look half dead. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and looking at Julia now, so those that are listening, go and look at the YouTube as well. You're just so full of light and vibrancy and you look healthy and I know the old anorexia brain anyone saying you look so well automatically was like oh that means you basically calling me fat I get it (laughs) but you just look and do you feel the the way that I see that I'm describing the way you look just vibrant and thriving I do emotionally yes physically I do feel restricted by the edema can you just describe what that is for those that don't know? It's kind of like water retention, bloating, where um, your body just holds on to loads and loads of water. It's like swelling yeah, to protect you, to make you stop and to make you listen and sit down and rest so that it can do all the internal repairs that you have created over so many years of starving the poor body. Yes, exactly that. And what about your digestive upset? So has has that settled down for you? Because I know that throughout your journey, your tummy was a bit all over the place and some people then restrict back and say they've got an allergy. And I advise you just keep going. Your body's getting used to everything. Don't get any tests done. Just keep pushing through. How is that now? Um, not perfect, mm-hmm. um, but so much better than it was. Um, I was in the loo just all the time and now not all the time so yeah it's definitely a lot better I can leave the house now which is all good (laughs) happy days yeah (laughs) um so yeah definitely improving good on the right path yeah and what was 
I'm going to ask two questions in one. The hardest thing about your recovery journey and the best thing about your recovery journey, which has only been, by the way, what, four and a half months as yeah. we're recording this? Wow. Um, the hardest thing was accepting that I literally had to give up everything else in my life to focus on recovery and give it everything I had because I didn't really have a lot mm. left to give. So the little I had, I had to give it to recovery. Um, the best thing was being able to feel even the sad stuff, mm. just being able to feel having the experience of the different emotions and stuff because even the bad ones are the growth and they they help you and they remind you that you're alive yeah and I don't think I was living to be fair no. I was existing I wasn't yeah. living exactly that and now your I would well I would describe your relationship as food but I would like it to hear it from you would you say that you're able to trust yourself and surrender into intuitive eating now so describe how your relationship with food and your body is now like four and a half months on from the from recovery well four and a half months ago you started like true recovery yeah um it's pretty good I can intuitively most of the time I still get some ED thoughts mm -hmm. um like you know, it's, you don't need to eat that you've already eaten something but they're, they're quite easy to just say no fuck off I'm doing what I want <laughs> good <laughs> um I think the only thing I have to be careful of is just if I'm busy or if I'm out and I haven't got food is mm. to eat when I feel hungry because if I don't then the hunger goes away and then it doesn't come back. Mm. And then I have to start false eating, like mechanically eating again. And that's just no fun. Yeah. So you do that from a place of self-care. So would you say it's yes. a mixture of eating intuitively, but then also just taking that precaution of making sure you have something in case you're hungry and you haven't got food around you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you didn't tell us about the Belvitas. <laughs> this is pretty common nighttime stuff and people don't really talk about it. So can you talk about your experience with that and where you are with that now? So once I started to feel hunger, I would start waking up in the night hungry. And um, bless you, you told me to eat whenever I felt hungry. So I started to try to find things to eat in the night, which kind of Crumbs in the bed are no good. <laughs> no. Um, and I didn't want to have to get up and go like rummaging around in the fridge and stuff for things in the middle of the night. So I came across Belvita biscuits <laughs> and they don't drop as many crumbs as a regular biscuit. <laughs> so I, I think I did probably two months solid of every single night, quite a few packets of Belvitas every night. Um. And now I did Belvita last night, but <laughs> <laughs> now it's not every night. I would say it's probably like twice a week now. Hmm. And it's just gradually not happening. But if I wake up and I'm hungry, I have them. But a lot of nights I do actually sleep and I didn't sleep for years. Hmm. So yeah. now, yeah, I'm catching up on sleep. How long did it take, if you can remember, roughly how many weeks or maybe months did it take until you started to actually, until your body was on board physically with eating, so you actually felt like you wanted to eat and you were hungry? Do you know? I don't think it was till after Christmas. So um, November, probably like 10 weeks yeah, it was, it was quite far in, wasn't it? About three quarters of the way in to coaching. Yeah. Up. And I remember you being like, Vic, I've had like a weird sensation. I think it's hunger. And I was like jumping down the phone like, <laughs> she's hungry. <laughs> and that's when the nighttime floodgates opened and the Belvita yeah. party started. Yes. <laughs> I still think they should sponsor me. 
A hundred percent they should sponsor you. The amount you've spent on Belvita biscuit. Right. Hey, it's crazy. <laughs> there are thousands. Supermarket delivery drivers give me very strange looks. <laughs> And when you first signed up to coaching, I know that you were in the perfect place from a coach's standpoint, do or die, which means yeah. you have to give it your all. Did you think you would be able to do it? Did you think coaching would, quote, work for you? How did you feel at the beginning in the unknown? I think I was just like, I've got to try anything. Um. And I don't know, I just, I just felt, I don't know why, I just felt that you could help me. I don't know why. The feeling, did you believe that I believed you could recover? Yes, I didn't believe I could recover, but I believed that you believed it. Yeah, the power of belief is insane and it's actually I'm not going to go into the science of this one because I won't describe it properly and it, it, people will be left confused. <laughs> but just off the back of Dr. Joe Dispenza, if anyone wants to dive into him, is incredible. The power of belief. Like if I believe that you believe sincerely, and I do, it has a huge positive effect on you and you experience mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So if anyone's looking for a coach, I mean, if they're listening to my stuff, then I assume they would want to work with me, which is great. But if they don't, that's fine too. Choose somebody who, number one, you think you can trust because obviously you don't know the relationship until you start one, but that you believe that they believe you can recover because that's everything yeah. you ask me. It really is. And that you think it's going to show up for you. Yes. Yeah. And really care. Yeah. Because there's a big difference. Having worked with many coaches before, you don't know 100%, but then you see throughout the relationship the coach's true colours, right? And that's why I only take on 10 clients at a time so I can be all you need me to be. Because if I've got 20, 30 clients, then you, phys you physically can't be there for no. everybody. No. How, how did you feel about the investment because obviously yeah. there's a lot that can block people and it, depending on your money situation, it's not quote cheap. How did you feel about that? Um, it felt like a lot of money, but the fact that it was a lot of money did make me more determined to make it work mm. um, and to show up for myself. And I think that that is actually part of it is that initial commitment to yourself to do it you're actually saying do you know what I want to recover so much I'm willing to put my savings into this or I'm willing to borrow to pay for this um I guess it depends how much you want to live and how much you want to recover but yeah. if you really if you're paying that amount of money then I think it's going to make you show up for yourself unless money's no object in which case good for you aren't you lucky <laughs> yeah indeed um but value wise honestly you've given me my life yes there's no value on that and I'm just so grateful that I mean I've not given it you I've shown you <laughs> how you've taught me how to live it yeah and I want to go into your 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 coaching journey now. So you are a recovery coach. Yes. And I want you to share with people how they can work with you. And and trust me, Julie is in a different container of mine with my best friend Rebecca and the wealth and self of rebellion about building your business and all of that. I promise you, and Julia, what she's charging now now for coaching will not be for much longer because she has me and Rebecca in her life and the investment's going to go up, right? And that's not to, that's not because it's all about the money. That's not it at all. It's because, and I've experienced this myself, the profound way you can help people transform their entire life and the, the love and time you give, it's priceless. And you've you've experienced this yourself, so have I, the investment that you exchange for that coaching, if it stretches the hell out of you, 
you're going to transform massively because you've got all your skin in the game. And so I promise you, Julie will not be charging this much for very long. So (laughs) if you've really enjoyed Man and Julie's conversation and you want to work with Julia, how can they do that? And what are you offering? How can they reach out to you? Brag, baby. Um, (laughs) At the moment, my website's under construction. but So the best way to reach out to me is on Instagram. Yeah. Um, it's at Julia Trahane. Um, and yeah, so just send me a, a message through Instagram um, and we can arrange a call to have a chat. Mm-hmm. And I'm offering a 12 week block of weekly one to one Zoom sessions and 24 seven WhatsApp support, mm-hmm. which is really where it all happens. It is. Um, and just. A, a promise to believe in you and show up for you and just love you till you recover. Yes. And you've walked through it yourself very recently. Yes. <laughs> so you know exactly the steps to take. And what was I going to say? It's gone, but it might come back. I was going to say something about um, about your coaching. Obviously, I'll post the your Instagram below so that they, they can reach out to you. Oh yes, yeah, so this is it. Are you primarily helping women in anorexia or are you open to helping orthorexia, bulimia? Like what do you what is it that you're really wanting to support women with? Um certainly anorexia, orthorexia, exercise addiction. Mm. Um I don't have personal experience of bulimia. Um, I have learned about it and I'm very happy if somebody feels that it's aligned for them to support them through bulimia. Um, it's not my strongest area of expertise, but I'm still very happy to. Yeah. And you're incredible. So whoever <laughs> is attracted to you and your coaching, they're going to be perfect for you. And the last thing I want to ask you, Julia, is what what message do you want to leave at the end of this conversation? So think of Let's think of you six months ago. Speak to her. Speak, give, give her. And when I say her, obviously, this is how I write my content. I speak to the past version of me, which there's so many women in the same place as you were. Mm -hmm. then. What do you want to say to her and to the women listening that need to hear it right now? That just. Getting up in the morning and showing up for yourself each day is all you need to do to start. You just have to want to recover and just show up and everything else will just work its way out and fall into place with support. It's tough on your own though. Yeah, I couldn't have done it on my own. I mean, the universe friggin' brought me a Dutch man in Egypt so I had to leave countries to recover because of the <laughs> I was in so <laughs> yeah reach out and get support Julia thank you so much for sharing your story there's so much depth of value in your story and I just want to say on air how inspired I am by you you are the most incredibly strong woman I have ever met in my entire life oh, and I you. love you so much thank you <laughs> Well, thank you thank you for helping me learn to live again and for your love and your support and you are amazing and I love you thank you thank you thank you oh, emotional <laughs> <laughs> ah, and listeners viewers thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time much love